96, we're on page 222, well actually we put on 222. The, uh, during this period of time they were having a lot of trouble with Islam. Islam was, uh, <laughs> ever since Muhammad we've had trouble with Islam. <laughs> As far as that goes, wherever they go in this world, there is problems, and they are in America today. You know, rioting from one, from the east to the west coast right now over this Palestinian uh, thing. When the Palestinians uh, attacked Israel, that was all right with them. That's just fine. That's what they deserved. You know, all the people they killed, the babies they beheaded, forty babies were beheaded, and all of that. But, Anyway, the end of the last chapter, number uh, 25, it talked about the Baptist being uh, tolerant to Islam. They didn't want, but Islam wasn't tolerant to them. The Baptists have always been tolerant to all religions. We've never killed people for being Islam or Catholics or anything else, but Islam and Catholics kill people all the time. And it's, it, Catholicism would still be doing that today if they had the power to do it. And now uh, we have such a liberal government that it is uh, intolerant to all conservative religions, period. Now, as we go on here, we're up in, in uh, church history. We're going to come to a man by the name of John Smith. John Smith, S-M-Y-T-H. John Smith, um, let's read about him here a little bit. This movement made a great noise in the world. It is a review of the... Reverend John Smith and his work in Holland and the connection of the English Baptists with that work. Now, John Smith's work, they have the Baptists starting in 1611. But the Baptists were in existence all the way back to the seashores of Galilee and especially in England and all over. We know that a church in Britain sent Patricus, or St. Patrick as the Catholics call him, into Ireland as a missionary. He established 365 churches. And the Irish uh, Baptists were very strong during that period of time, and this were in the, in the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries. And then Britain went back into paganism, basically. And so the Irish Christianized Britain again over hundreds of years, you know, this all took place. <clears throat> Says John Smith has been the occasion of many violent controversies, an episode in his life, where it can scarcely be called more than that, has been provocation of the writing of many books, and in this day authors find a uh, perennial interest in his doings and going about. Some assert that while he lived in Gainsborough, in 1606 he turned Baptist, and was baptized by John Morton, in the river Don. Others assert that the manuscript which gives this account is a forgery. And some assert that in later day, in Holland, he baptized himself. Others declare that he was baptized by Helwes, and some say uh, that the first general Baptist churches in England originated with him and his company. And some of these general Baptists, some of these became free will Baptists later. Uh, let me tell you about free will Baptists for just a moment. Free will Baptists are only Baptists in their mode of baptism. They're pure Armenians. Baptists are not Armenians. Armenians is that you work your way to heaven. That, uh, that uh, salvation is a combination of works and grace. Baptists have never taught that, period. And this group is not strong Baptists at all. They said the Baptist churches in England originated with him and his company, while others declared that there were Baptist churches in England long previous to this date, which there were. 
Such are some of the contradictions which arise in the investigation of the details of the life of this singular and gifted man. The date and place of his birth have not been ascertained. It is certain that he was educated at Cambridge. Cambridge, of course, you know, is a is college there in Cambridge. He entered the university May, March the 15th, 1588, in Christ College and graduated a Master of Arts, an MA degree, in 1593. He was ordained clergyman of the Church of England by William Wickman in 1594. He was elected preacher of the city of Lincoln on September the 27th, 1600 and entered his services there October 13, 1602. It is certain that while in this place he rejected the doctrines of the Anabaptists. Now what is Anabaptist? Remember what Anabaptist is? Double. They, they, they dipped people. They would not accept anybody else's baptism. They said you've got to go back to Christ and have authority. And, and they said none of these other churches had any authority to baptize, so they baptized everybody that came to them. And that's something that Baptists have done for ever since the seashores of Galilee would have been Anabaptists, okay? And believe that uh, slanders allegedly against the Smith, uh, a pattern of true papaya, that is. He remained in London until 1606 and became pastor of an independent church in Gainsborough. He remained there to some day preceding 1608 and he removed to Holland. While he was pastor at Gainsborough, a manuscript which purports to be the minutes of the Baptist Church in Epworth and Crow, the Vienna Baptist Magazine, was where it quoted from, in 1606, March the 24th, this night at midnight, Elder John Morton baptized John Smith, vicar of the Gainsborough in the River Don. It was dark, and we were obliged to have torch lights. Elder Brewster prayed, and Mr. Smith made a good confession of faith, walked to Edward in his cold clothes, but received him no harm. They were always afraid if you were baptized, you were going to catch cold or pneumonia and die. <laughs> that was the thing about it. They didn't take baths. These people didn't take baths. They thought water communicated illnesses. They'd wash themselves off a little bit and per perfume on, that was about it. The distance was over two miles, and all of our friends were present to the triune God be praised. The occasion of the publication of these extracts was the reopening of the chapel and crowd on June 8, 1879. Many more of these records were printed at that time, and on its publication, this document was violently assailed in the United States as a forgery because of the alleged immersion of Smith by Morton. There were many things recorded in these minutes of Epworth and Crowell which were not easily understood, other things which were improbable, and still others which seemed to be impossible. But when one remembers that there was a veil of secrecy thrown over all the doings of the separatists, the separatists were Baptists. Abraham Lincoln's family were separatists. He did not take up that good torch in his life. The separatists that some of the most influential men secretly sympathized with and possibly belonged to them, and the deeper one reads into the history of these times, the more clearly and likely it is he conceived that that dissent was widespread. When one remembers all of this, he is not likely to be dogmatic in his assertions. It is possible that these minutes were compilations, but one had better not learn, lean too heavily on unauthenticated documents and manuscripts. I've heard Baptist preachers get up. I've been present and I know them. And they are so, what we call, eager to prove the lineage of Baptist churches from this one to this one to this one to this one, all back all the way back to the seashores of Galilee. But sometimes in history there are great lapses of two and three hundred years, but they're there. But you can't prove it dogmatically. But one thing you can prove about Baptists, they were always Anabaptists. And they always had what we call 
a democratic government in their churches. Shortly after Smith arrived in Holland, he repudiated his former baptism, and this was probably about the year 1609. He remained a Baptist a short time and was then excluded by the church, which he organized, and Thomas Helwig became pastor and leader. After a later date, Smith applied to the Mennonites for membership. Now, Mennonites, what are Mennonites? They were follow, followers of Menno Simmons. Menno Simmons was a Catholic priest, and he became a Baptist. He was converted by reading the Bible and the preaching of Baptists. And these Baptists and they were called Anabaptists, and because they were followers of Menno Simmons, they called them Mennonites. But they are Anabaptists. The Amish are Anabaptists. The Mennonites have gone all over the world. Calvin and Luther both persecuted Anabaptists, the Mennonites, and all of these people back then. Because Calvin and Luther didn't understand anything but church and state. If you lived in a country, if that country was a Calvinist, you were got to be that. If it was Lutheran, you had to be that. If it was Germany, you had to be Lutheran. Anything else, you were persecuted. They didn't understand anything about religious liberty at all. And here in America, we wouldn't have any religious, religious liberty at all if it hadn't been for the Baptists fighting so hard in the American Revolution and then fighting so hard to get uh, what we call the Bill of Rights and the amendments. At a later date, Smith applied to the Mennonites for membership, but after much discussion and disturbance among them, his application was rejected. It was the occasion of a great debate, which acrimony among the Mennonites, letters were written by many parties and some of the Mennonite churches went so far as to formally condemn the Union in severe terms. Two Mennonite preachers, Riss and Gedritz, wrote confessions which were favorable to the Mennonites and had Smith and others sign at them. The confessions only dismissed both parties and failed to bring a union. This is what they call a confession of faith or a doctrinal statement. Of the 42 English who signed one of the 11 erased their names. The gravest dissatisfaction arose over it among the Mennonites themselves. The result was that Smith was not received by the Mennonites and the remnant of his company was only received after years of waiting and then not without friction. Let's go back. Now, how did the Mennonites get to be Mennonites? Where did they come from? How did they get there? Where did by the, the Mennonites... name, you mean? Where? The name? Or you're talking oh, the about Mennonite it? name came from Menno Simmons. But they were Anabaptists. But how did they get to Germany? How did they get to, to China? How did they get to Russia? If you go back in history, there were seven churches of Asia that, that the Apostle John wrote letters to. Now, there were a lot more churches of Asia than that. But the churches of Asia at that period of time, now all of these were Christian churches, but later on, after... 7, 800, 900 A.D., the Muslims took over all of what we call Asia Minor. And they would not allow any Christianity there at all. So, these churches fled to the valleys of the Piedmont. The valleys of the Piedmont. Mm -hmm. Up into the Alps. Into the French and the Spanish Alps and all the way back up and through that area. And then when the Catholic Church went in there, by Samuel Moore in that green book up there above your head there, Larry with gold lettering on it. They went in there, the Catholic Church went in there and burned the people. They ate the women. <laughs> they prodded them around and walked through the streets with their bodies impaled on, on saffs and, and that's horrible what they did. And some of these people they killed were nearly a hundred years old. And they raped the women and then they would, they would butcher them and eat them. Cook them. Now, this is uh, pretty vicious things that happened. Well, Samuel Morton wrote that history about it. But these people that escaped, escaped and went into China, they went into Russia, they went into Germany. <clears throat> and they went in there, and the Anabaptists there, now when Menno Simmons was a Catholic priest, he came in contact with the Anabaptists. 
And he began to listen. To, if the Catholic priest, they learned the liturgy of the, the communion, all the rites and the ceremonies they went through. Many of them, they, they did it all in Latin, and many of them didn't know Latin. They just remembered and memorized the phrases. And it was a very formal outward religion. And uh, Minnell Simmons, when he was became contact in contact with Baptist or Anabaptist at that time, he heard the preaching of the gospel, and he was converted, and he was baptized by them. Again, baptized Anabaptist. He was baptized, and then he began had a lot of followers because he began preaching. And then at this period of time also when Luther was separating and, and he wrote his 99 theses uh, and the, that he posted, he asked them to not preach against him. And they said, we will let you do whatever you want to. You preach and we preach. This. And they said, why don't you join us? They told Luther, why don't you join us? He didn't want to join the Baptists. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. These are what you call the reformers. John Calvin didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. And so they took up the practice of church and state and they began to persecute Baptists. After, they got, after Luther got a stronghold, then he began to persecute. Now let's go on a little bit further now. 42 English who signed of them 11 erased their names. And the greatest dissatisfaction arose among the Mennonites themselves. The result was the smith was not received by the Mennonites and the remnant of his company only, only received after years of waiting and then not without friction. The subject of Anabaptism was not new among the separatists in Holland. Francis Johnson testified in 1606 that a little while after 1593 when his church immigrated, diverse of them fell into the heresies of the Anabaptists, which are too common in these countries, and so persisting were excommunicated by the rest. John Payne mentions that the English Baptists bred in the Low Countries, and the Hinnock, Clapman, and the same year had trouble with Anabaptists in his separatist church in Amber, Amsterdam. Extraordinary and animosity had been developed in this decimation and this dissension in the point where Smith rebaptized himself or was baptized by Hewley's. He was surrounded by Dutch Baptists, but he did not apply for them for baptism. Now these Dutch Baptists also came into Holland because of persecution from the, the what we call Asia Minor. They all moved out in there. And of course there were churches established in Britain by the Apostle Paul. And that's the one that what we call St. Patrick was part of it, Patricus. He did not apply to them for baptism. The Peter Baptist story goes on that he first baptized himself, then Hollies, and then the remainder of the company, he has since been called a sea baptist. The story has been used with uncommon gravity of the opponents of Baptist principles and replied, replied to with no small amount of indignation and as a calamity in the man. Baptist writers have usually taken strong ground against Smith having baptized himself. It is different to see that difference to analyze and what makes Smith baptize himself or was baptized by Hewley's. When Smith baptized himself, that is, it is certain that Smith and his church thought that they had the right to or originate baptism among themselves and quoted the example of John the Baptist to sustain it. Their real trouble was not baptism but church authority church succession and church authority. That's the difference in Baptists. True Baptists believe in church succession. That the church handed down authority all the way from the seashores of Galilee and it's still in these churches today. 
And that church, that authority never was in the Catholic Church. It never was in the Protestant churches at all. But it was in Baptist succession. Smith was led to doubt whether there was any baptized churches in the world, and hence any true succession. It may be a moment of a remark that the baptism of Smith did not affect the baptism of the Baptist churches in England at all. They were still real Baptist churches there. It has been affirmed that the General Baptist Churches of England originated with a church of Smith's, that this was a mother church in of Baptist. Now see there's where I had one guy come to my class 20 years ago and he was a Calvinist, uh, basically a Presbyterian, but he was coming to a Baptist church. And he tried to start the Baptist church in 1611 with John Smith. That's not where it started. But that's what many historians say that are outside of Baptist ranks because they don't understand Baptist succession, church succession. And even the Baptist denomination originated here in the, in the year 1609, and after prolonged investigation, we, we are unable to find the evidence that any Baptist church grew out of this one. We are able to find that after Hewley settled with his church in London, some churches affiliated with it, and a certain correspondence with some Mennonites in Holland. And remember, these Mennonites were from Anabaptist in what we call in Holland and Germany. But they had no common origin, nowhere to manifest. If such proof exists, has escaped our attention. The Baptist historians of England are singularly unanimous on this point. If he, Smith, was guilty of what we charge him with, says Crosby, Charles Crosby, Church of England, or History of English Baptists, there's no blemish on the English Baptists who neither approved any such method, nor did they receive their baptism from him. Crosby's History of the English Baptist, Volume 1, page 99. Iva me had no such opinion, referring to the origin of the particular Baptist in the reign of Charles I. He says, It was during this reign that an event took place among the Baptists, which has been commonly but erroneously considered as the commencement of their history in this, century, in this country. This was the formation of some churches in London, which may have supposed to first have been this denomination of this kingdom, of, in the kingdom. But he could not be proved that there were no distinct Baptist churches till this period. It would not follow that there were no Baptists, which, however, has been confidently stated, we have shown the presence and the persons repressing similar sentiments with these and the present English Baptists have been found in every period of English history and the English church, all the way back. All the way back to the Apostle Paul, basically. And also as early as the year 1589 from the testimony of Dr. Soane. There were many churches of this description in London and in this country and during the reign of James. We have produced unexceptional proof. The reign of James. Now, who's James? King James. King James, the one that made the King James Bible. Why did he print the King James Bible? They had to be Baptists there because they, in the pre preface to the King James Bible, it said that, that they were standing against people that wouldn't have anything else but what they hammered out on their own apple, and then the Romish people also. So the Baptists were there. And he wrote the King James Bible to keep people from going into the Baptist ranks. And the King James Bible was a very, what we might call, colored or... Uh, they wouldn't translate anything out of the original languages that might go contrary to the beliefs and the practices of the Church of England. And one of them was, was baptism by sprinkling. And another was they baptized for the remission of sins. And so the, the Acts 2.38, you're baptized for the remission of sins. And that's what it says. It says you're baptized because of the remission of sins. During the reign to James, we have produced unexceptional proof that there were great numbers of Baptists who suffered imprisonment in diverse countries. And remember, Bloody Mary, 
Bloody Mary burned Baptist right and left. They were there in her reign. They were there in Elizabeth's reign. They were there in James' reign. Baptists suffered imprisonment in diverse countries. That A petition to the king was signed by many of their ministers. It is thought that the General Baptist Church in Canterbury was for 250 years and that John Bucare, who was burnt in the reign of Edward VI, was a member of it. Adam Taylor, who wrote the history of the General Baptist, has, has a chapter upon the history of the English General Baptist from the Reformation to the commencement of the 18th century. This church of Smiths appears to have been the first Baptist church composed of Englishmen after the Reformation. Taylor is doubtlessly wrong in this statement. This was the first church composed only of Englishmen, as the General Baptist Taylor affirms and traces their history from the Reformation. The Baptist church went back before the Reformation. The Baptist churches were not part of the Reformation. Remember what the Reformation is. The Reformation is John, Calvin, and Martin Luther coming out of the Catholic Church and trying to reform the Catholic Church. They kept baptismal regeneration, infant baptism, they kept all the things that the Catholicism, the church and state, but they wanted salvation by grace and not by through the sacraments. <clears throat> it has been assumed by some that Smith was baptized by a fusion. What's a fusion? What's a fusion? Some other mode besides dipping. <laughs> a fusion is an, is an excuse or a supplement. The point has been made that he was surrounded by Dutch Mennonites who invariably in his plain practice sprinkling and Smith learned his practice from them. Smith was not a Dutchman, but an Episcopalian from the north of England. It was the Presbyter Presbyterians and not the Church of England, but the Scottish emperors. It was the Presbyterians that instituted sprinkling, not the Church of England. Remember, Henry VIII was baptized by immersion. And the Church of England made a statement that they would not want to, they did not want to recognize any other mode of baptism but immersion except in places of what we call clinical baptism as that you were too sick to be dipped then you could be poured upon now the word for dipping and bapt in Greek is baptizo the word for sprinkling is rontizo and the word for pouring is nipto now the Bible doesn't say go out and nipto people it doesn't go out and say that Ron tees them and says, go out and baptize them, immerse them. The Latin word emergio comes right straight out of the word, the cross-reference in the Greek lexicon, Greek Latin lexicon as immersion. We get our word immersion from the Latin in English. It was the Presbyterians, not the Church of England, from the Scottish influence introduced sprinkling into England. At the very time before Smith left England, the Church of England was using radical measures to prevent the growth of effusion in that country. Proof must be introduced to show that Baptists differed from his fellow churchmen in this practice. Such proof is absolutely unknown. Now that's our first message for today. A fusion. John Smith. John Smith was, was not really ever a real Baptist. He was a pseudo-Baptist. He was a Baptist by what we might call decoration of some. Our Father, we send this message out for your honor and glory. We pray that you use it wherever it goes to build up your people that they might understand why they're Baptists and what Baptists are. Please forgive me where I fail you in Jesus' name.